good morning. Um, before we begin, would one of you be willing to open us in prayer? Pray. Yeah. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to under the name of Jesus. We thank you for this day. Thank you for the class we are about to have. For we just pray that you'll help us to understand the subjects as uh, with our mom teaches us, Lord. Uh, give us your wisdom and understanding. Holy Spirit, you'll be in the midst of our classes. Let nothing be a distraction for us, God, but uh, help us to grab the truth and the uh, store it in our heart treasure it in our heart so that uh, we can live an amazing life for you so that we can bring people towards your kingdom so that we can be a blessing to others we just give you all the glory and honor in jesus name i pray amen thank you um so we're kind of at the last two weeks of the semester uh, we're a little bit behind so we're gonna have to try and cover seven chapters, I think, in the next two weeks. Uh, so we try and go a little bit quickly. Um, I will be posting your final quiz this week. So just be on the lookout for that. I'll post it uh, online. And you can submit it any time before the end of the semester. Uh, and then that will be the last of the assignments. So your final paper and the final quiz. Um, any questions on assignments, anything you want to address before we go into Second Corinthians? Okay, uh, let's go um, go back to, we're going to start with chapter 7, so we'll skip our recap for today, but we will have to look just briefly at some things that Paul talks in, uh, talks about in chapter six um, to understand what he starts with in chapter seven. Uh, so let's begin with chapter seven. If somebody can read for us, um, let me just open that up. We can begin with chapter seven. Uh, just the first few verses, if someone can read that for us. Yeah, let's uh, let's just read chap uh, the verse one, and then we'll discuss that, and then go into the rest of the chapter. And for having these promises delivered, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Thank you, John. So um, we see here Paul is kind of looking back at chapter six and he says, therefore, having these promises. So uh, chapter six uh, in verses 16 to 18, he talks about uh, putting away uh, all sinfulness, putting away all idols, uh, coming out, separating themselves from all sin and God will receive them back as sons and daughters. And so here he's saying, we have this promise that we will be received back as sons and daughters. Uh, and so he says, therefore, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. Um, and then uh, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So there is a a call to action here and that is uh, that act of cleansing ourselves is actually something that we should take responsibility for uh, it is not something we can passively just say okay we've received christ and now uh, we leave the rest up to Christ, right? He has to work out our sanctification for us. Uh, that's not the way we look at it. Rather, we take steps to uh, examine ourselves, to uh, allow the Holy Spirit to work in us. And this uh, truly is a work of the Holy Spirit. So uh, with the Holy Spirit, we pray for uh, exposure of sin within our lives. We allow God to uh, remove those things within us. We take steps to uh, to uh, step away from sin. So we have to take active uh, 
participation in that to cut away sin from our lives um, and then we allow the holy spirit to uh, continue to give us grace in all of that so it's us working with the holy spirit to move away from sin uh, so romans 8 13 says if you live according to the flesh you will die if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body you will live so a reminder that even as we're called to uh, that life of holiness we're doing it by the power of the holy spirit um, and then paul ends with this perfecting holiness in the fear of god uh, perfecting holiness perfecting uh, means to bring to completion or to uh, bring something to its perfect end and holiness uh, of course is the majesty and purity and complete uh, complete otherness of god and so to come to that place of uh, complete purity, complete uh, perfection in uh, in Christ, right? That is what we are uh, working towards. And we do that, uh, we pursue that Christ-likeness uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's go on from there. Uh, we'll read verses 2 and 3. Someone can read that for us. Open your heart to us. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We have cheated no one. I, I do not say this to condemn, for I have said before that you are in our hearts to die together and to live together. Thank you. So um, here again, Paul, uh, we saw Paul earlier uh, in chapter 6, uh, calling them back to this place of openness to Paul. Uh, and we talked a little bit about that, about uh, there being some uh, degree of estrangement between them because of some things that Paul had written in uh, a letter to them, correcting them, uh, that caused a lot of grief. And today we'll be looking a little more at that in this chapter, chapter 7. Uh, so here again, he's calling them back to that, to a place of openness to him. Uh, and based on the fact that they have wronged no one, they've corrupted no one and cheated no one. So they've not done anything um, to, they've not sinned against anyone. They've not done anything unjust against anyone. Uh, they've not led them away from God, rather. They've led them to God, right? We have not corrupted no one. And we have cheated no one. So we have not tried to take advantage of you in any way. So look at that. Uh, and that is evidence that you can trust us. Um, and so this is something for us also in ministries to be... Uh, to be keeping in mind that we do not uh, wrong anyone, we don't corrupt people, we don't cheat people. Uh, if we can say that about our ministries, then uh, that is a beautiful testimony of our hearts before God and that we as ministers of God can be trusted. Uh, and then he says, I don't say this to condemn you, for I have said before that you are in our hearts. So he hasn't explicitly said uh, exactly what he says here, but he has uh, referred to his sufferings uh, that, um, that, the, that he has been willing to undergo for their sakes. Right? So uh, we see that in chapter 6, he talks a lot about all of the sufferings uh, that they have experienced. He talks about uh, dying, yet continuing to live for their sakes. And so uh, he's referring back to that and saying, we are willing to both die and live with you. Uh, from there, we move on to verses 4 to 12. If you could read that, please, verses 4 to 12. Great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my boasting on your behalf. I am filled with comfort. I am exceedingly joyful in all your, all our tribulation. For indeed, when we came to Macedonia, our bodies had no rest. But we were troubled on every side. Outside were conflicts, inside were fears. 
Nevertheless, God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus, and not only by his coming, but also by the consolation with which he was comforted in you. When he told us of your earnest desire, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced even more. For even if I made you sorry with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. For I perceive that the same epistle made you sorry, though only for a while. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. For observe this very thing, that you sorrowed in a godly manner, what diligence it produced in you, what clearing of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what vehement desire, what zeal, what vindication. In all things you proved yourself to be clear in this matter. Therefore, although I wrote to you, I did not do it for the sake of him who had done the wrong, nor for the sake of him who, who suffered wrong, but that our care for you in the sight of God might appear to you. Thank you. So, um, so here uh, verse four, he's saying, um, not only is my speech towards you, so when I'm speaking to you, I speak boldly, but also when I boast about you, uh, I boast with so much confidence. Uh, and he's uh, now moving into this part, which actually uh, will give us a better understanding of this whole letter of why he's talked so much about uh, opening your hearts to us, uh, come back and receive us, all of those things uh, he's addressing in this chapter. So. Um, he started talking about this in chapter two. We look a little bit at chapter two. And so he comes back to it here, uh, kind of bringing a conclusion to what he started in chapter two. Um, so he says, I'm filled with comfort. I'm exceedingly joyful in all our tribulation. Um, and then in verse five, he says, for indeed, we came to Macedonia. So. Um, this goes back to 2 Corinthians 2.13. So let's just go back to 2 Corinthians 2 and uh, we can read from uh, verse 12 and 13 in chapter 2. So we remember what he was talking about there and we can uh, connect this to that. Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened to me by the Lord, I had no rest in my spirit because I did not find Titus, my brother. But taking my leave of them, I departed for Mastod. So here he was talking about uh, going. So he had gone uh, to Corinth. He met with the Corinthians. Uh, he actually had a difficult time with them because he had brought correction to them. We see that in the beginning of chapter two. And from there, he went on to Troas and then uh, from there to Macedonia. So uh, in verse five of this chapter, chapter seven, he's saying, when we came to Macedonia, our bodies had no rest. He's continuing that journey. Uh, so he stopped there in chapter two and he's continuing here. Uh, but we were troubled on every side. Outside were conflicts, inside were fears. So he's talking about the challenges that they faced there. While there was a lot of fruit in the ministry that they were doing in Macedonia, um, he also had uh, challenges, persecution of uh, just dealing with things in the church. And so he's not afraid to talk about those things. Uh, he is secure enough in who he is in Christ and as a minister of God that he can talk about the challenges uh, openly. He doesn't have to pretend like everything is perfect. So outside there were conflicts and inside he had to deal with his own fears, uh, the challenges uh, that he faced as a minister in serving the people. Uh, so uh, he's not only carrying uh, the ministry of Macedonia 
uh, all of those challenges in his heart. He's also carrying this Corinthian conflict that is happening in his heart. So it's a lot of uh, his own emotional uh, struggles that are happening while he's also doing ministry and facing those challenges. Uh, verse 6, nevertheless, God who comforts the downcast comforted us by the coming of Titus. So we see this language of comfort again. He talks about it in chapter 1. Uh, he says, uh, praise be to God, the Father of compassion, the God of all comfort. And he talks about how God comforts us in our suffering so that we can comfort others. So he goes back to that theme here in verse 6, uh, talking about how God comforted them because he met Titus. So he was waiting to meet Titus because Titus was not in Troas. He went on to Macedonia to meet Titus. And why was he anxious to meet Titus? One of the reasons was because Titus was coming back from the Corinthian church uh, to give him a report of what had happened. Um, now, to understand what the issue was here, we look at uh, a little more at chapter 2, uh, the first few verses. If we can read from uh, chapter 2, let me just open that up. Yeah, let's, uh, let's just read chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. Someone can read that for us, please. But I determined this within myself that I would not come again to you in sorrow. For if I make you sorrowful, then who is he who makes me glad but the one who is made sorrowful by me? And I wrote this very thing to you, lest when I came I should not have sorrow over those from whom I ought to have joy. Having confidence in you, all that my joy is the joy of you all. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart I wrote to you with many tears, not that you should not be grieved, but that you might know the love which I have so abundantly for you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we have that context of uh, Paul had made a painful visit to Corinth in verse 1, uh, chapter 2, verse 1, we read that. Uh, and that visit had been to address some issues that were going on there. Now, it isn't clear what the issues were, um, but uh, but it seems that there was something that he wanted to address in person. So he went there in person. Uh, he met with them. And um, and that was not a visit that ended well. So he left there with great distress and anguish and with many tears. So there, there was a lot of um, uh, a heavy burden that he was carrying from that uh, issue and how we had been addressed, uh, how they had uh, together worked through it, it had not been resolved. And so uh, he leaves um, he leaves Corinth and then he sends Titus to go back uh, with uh, uh, to find out how they are responding to what has happened. And so we'll read, uh, we'll go back to chapter 7, verses 8 to 12, to read what happened uh, once Titus visited them. Chapter 7, verses 8 to 12. For even I may, yeah, for even if I made you sorry with my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, for I perceive that the same epistle made you sorry, though only for a while. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted. But the sorrow of the world produces death. For observe this very thing, that you sorrowed in a godly manner, 
what diligence it produced in you, what clearing of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what vehement desire, what seal, what vindication. In all things, you proved yourself to be clear in this matter. Therefore, although I wrote to you, I did not do it for the sake of him who had done the wrong, nor for the sake of him who suffered the wrong, but that our care for you in the sight of God might appear to you. Thank you. So, uh, so here we see what happened. So Paul sent Titus back with a letter, and um, that letter uh, made made the church again uh, quite upset. It affected the church, uh, and Paul actually regretted sending the letter because um, because he knew that that had brought them sorrow, but. That sorrow eventually led to repentance. And so he differentiates here uh, between a godly sorrow versus a worldly sorrow. Uh, and, and seeing what is the fruit of godly sorrow versus a sorrow that comes from the world. So godly sorrow leads, leads to repentance because there is a conviction of sin. Uh, there is repentance and there is hope uh, and there is change that comes from a godly sorrow versus a sorrow that comes from the world where there is no hope. Uh, instead, it leads to hopelessness, it leads to condemnation, it leads to death. And so it's important here to differentiate between the two. When we are bringing correction to people, when we are addressing things, uh, what are we trying to uh, do? What, what do we want to see? happen as a result of that correction. We want to see conviction, we want to see repentance, we want to see change. Uh, if those, uh, that is the result of what we have done when we are bringing correction, then it is a good thing. On the other hand, if there is hopelessness, if they are feeling condemned, um, if, they, uh, if they actually are going away from God, uh, then that kind of, uh, that kind of correction, we'll have to reflect on whether we've corrected uh, in a right way or if they have responded in a wrong way. So, what is what can what is the problem here? Have we done something wrong, or have they responded incorrectly? Though we've brought right correction to them, um, and so here, although Paul regretted sending the letter when he saw the results uh, of what he had written and saw that there was repentance, there was change. Uh, he, he recognizes that what he did was the right thing, it was the best thing for them. Uh, and so we see here, there is a list of eight things that the Corinthians did as a result. So uh, the fruit of that correction. So one is diligence, that is they responded with an earnest or eager desire to change, a clearing of oneself. So. Uh, a desire to uh, to make things right, indignation, that is recognition of uh, something that was wrong and they were also upset by what was wrong, uh, fear, that is uh, they were alarmed by that by the things that were going on in the church. So until that time, they had not been uh, affected by it. But when Paul sent that correction when he sent that letter, they also felt that same level of, um, of uh, discomfort or unhappiness with what had happened. Um, five is a vehement desire, so a longing to change, a zeal, a passion, um, vindication, so, uh, so uh, doing, taking whatever actions are needed to make things right. And then proving themselves to be uh, to be clear, so proving that they uh, wanted to do the right thing, and so because they've taken those steps, they've done all of those things. Paul now knows that they were truly sorry, um, and they truly trusted him. And so he says, verse twelve: Although I wrote to you, I didn't do it for the sake of the person who had wronged, uh, who had done the wrong, or the person who suffered the wrong. So uh, here it seems that Paul himself was the one who suffered 
the wrong. Um, it seems uh, from chapter two that there was that there was a conflict between him and somebody else, and so. Uh, we look at chapter two uh, when I had done the recording in that video. Uh, the second part of chapter two, after he talks about his grief after the visit, he talks about uh, this correction and he talks about. So uh, some people think it refers back to um, the sin that was mentioned in First Corinthians, right? About the person who was uh, was having uh, sex with his uh, father's wife. But this is um, a different, uh, some people say that this is a different conflict that he's talking about, uh, which was something else that happened after First Corinthians was written and before Second Corinthians, so something in between those two letters. And so that is the thing that he's addressing here. So with that, we move on to verses 13 to 16. If someone can read those last few verses in chapter 7. Therefore, we have been comforted in your comfort, and we rejoiced exceedingly more for the joy of Titus, because his spirit has been refreshed by you all. For if in anything I have boasted to him about you, I am not ashamed. But as we spoke all things to you in truth, even so our boasting to Titus was found true. And his affections are greater for you as he remembers the obedience of you all. How with fear and trembling you received him. Therefore I rejoice that I have confidence in you in everything. So uh, Paul closes this chapter with uh, with explaining this is what uh, he found comfort in. So um, although he was having challenges in Macedonia and he was already burdened by what was happening in Corinth, once Titus came back with this report, uh, Paul was comforted, uh, not only because of the good news of how the church had responded, but also because Titus himself had been blessed uh, by his time with the Corinthian church. Um, and then Paul uh, also is uh, comforted in the fact that he knows that his boasting in the church was found to be true, it proved to be true uh, because of how the church responded. Uh, and he talks about their obedience uh, and how they had shown respect and uh, love towards Titus and had received him with that kind of love. And so this is what brings Paul great joy, is that he can have confidence in this church. Uh, um, this, uh, that, that there will be those kinds of challenges where sin needs to be addressed, where correction needs to be brought. And we don't know uh, if it will always be taken well. Uh, so our job is to do that, to correct people, uh, to call them to righteousness, to holiness, uh, to uh, doing what is right before God. We have to be faithful to do that, as Paul did, right? He did that even though it was a difficult thing uh, and if it was a challenging thing and he himself was wondering whether it was the best thing that he had done. Uh, but because he was faithful to do it, the church was able to repent. They were able to set things right. And um, they were able to come uh, to a place of uh, right standing before God because of that. Uh, and they had to go through this period of sorrow. They had to go through this period of grief. Paul and the church had to go through those challenges in their relationship. Uh, but the end result was a church that was stronger and a relationship that is restored. And uh, that is what brings Paul joy, knowing uh, that their response was proof of uh, of their love and respect for him as their leader, uh, but also uh, that they were truly now in a good place uh, spiritually as well. So that's something for us uh, to take away as leaders, as ministers. How do we deal with conflict? 
uh, how can we uh, best address issues. So we see also how Paul, um, he visits them, he talks to them, and then he his plan was to go back and visit them, right? From Macedonia, he was supposed to go back. But because of how difficult that first meeting was, he chose to send a letter through Titus. So even in that, how did he navigate the issues, uh, recognizing that sometimes it's better to meet in person, sometimes it's better to have somebody else uh, go on our behalf, uh, and how do we address the issues that are there? Uh, so sending that letter, addressing it through a letter, uh, then send and having Titus there to work that out with the church on his behalf. And so after this is when Paul goes back to Corinth. Uh, after he receives this report, after he hears about how the church is doing, he goes back and he'll start to talk about that uh, in the following chapters, about going back to receive the collection for the saints. Um, so chapter 8, um, we see here now, uh, chapter 1 was talking about Paul's visit to the church, what he had planned to do, how the plans changed because of all of this conflict. Uh, chapter 2, we saw more about that, about the conflict. And then from 2 till chapter 7, Paul was talking about, he was defending himself, his ministry. He was calling the church to open their hearts to him, to be receptive of him, uh, proving by his the way he had carried out his ministry that he had done it with a heart that was uh, fully pure towards them. His motives were pure towards them. And so chapter 7 kind of concludes all of that. And from chapter 8 onwards, he uh, moves into this uh, talking about the collection that we saw in 1 Corinthians, where they were collecting money to contribute to the church in Jerusalem. Um, and so he will start to talk about that in chapter uh, 8. So we'll just read uh, this a little bit from 1 Corinthians 16, 1, 4, where that uh, where he talked about the collections. He says, now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there, may, that there be no collections when I come. And when I come, whomever you approve by your letters, I will send to bear your gift to Jerusalem. But if it is fitting that I go also, they will go with me. Um, so this is where he had actually asked them to start setting aside money uh, for the church in Jerusalem. Um, from here, we can uh, start in chapter 8, if someone can read verses 1 to 7, please. Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abundant in the riches of their uh, liber uh, liberty. For I bear witnesses that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were free, uh, freely willing imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints, and not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. So we urge Titus that as he had begun, so he would also complete this grace in you as well. But as you abound in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all diligence, and in your love for us, see that you abound in this grace also. Thank you. Uh, so uh, let's just, we. I'm not sure if all of you have your notes open, but I'll just share this. Uh, map just so we know where. Uh, so um, on the map you see in the south uh, here is where Corinth is and Macedonia was up there. So Paul had traveled through Corinth, uh, he had gone to Troas and then gone to Macedonia. And so he's writing from here. Um, 
and he in Macedonia, these were the three Philippi, Thessalonica, and Beria were the three places where we know that he mostly was ministry. Uh, so we, he's talking about these churches, that these churches uh, were the ones who had given generously towards the church in Jerusalem. Um, and Corinth was in the region of Achaia. So we'll hear him referring to Achaia a little later. Um, so Achaia was in southern Greece, and Corinth was uh, a capital of Achaia. So uh, here in chapter 8, he's talking about the Macedonians and how generously they gave. Uh, he also talks about the fact that they were actually facing a lot of challenges. Uh, so in the midst of their trials and in the midst of their poverty, so it was not that they were very rich. Uh, it was that they were poor, but even then they gave uh, generously out of their poverty uh, to help the church in Jerusalem that was having uh, both financial struggles and uh, there was a famine and so to help out the people there are the believers in Jerusalem. Uh, so in chapter 3, for I bear, in verse 3 sorry, of chapter 8, um, I bear witness that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they were willing to give. Uh, so why is Paul sharing this? He wants to encourage the Corinthian church uh, by giving the example of the Macedonians. So uh, he wants to say that, look at how the Macedonians gave. They had all of these uh, the trials that the church itself was facing, uh, the difficulties, the persecutions that they were facing. Uh, and they were poor, but they still gave generously with willing hearts. Um, and not only did they give, they uh, actually begged Paul. So we see in verse 4, imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift uh, and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. So uh, that they, uh, that uh, Paul would take that gift and would give them the opportunity to minister to the saints in Jerusalem. So uh, by giving to these saints, there was a sharing in their suffering, right? Uh, by uh, sacrif sacrificially giving from whatever they had, uh, they were able to share with the uh, saints in Jerusalem. So that fellowship uh, was there in the suffering of the people in Jerusalem. And then verse 5, not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. And this is an important thing, uh, that it was because they had given themselves to the Lord uh, that they were able to give uh, in this way towards uh, towards the church. Right. So they were able to give themselves to what Paul and uh, Timothy and Titus were doing uh, to the ministry. This of uh, being surrendered, we are giving, we are doing a good thing, and uh, almost this notion of. Uh, that is where salvation will come from, from our good works. Uh, but that's not a right way of thinking. Um, on the other hand, people may give because uh, there is a sense of guilt or uh, there is a sense of uh, they, they want to make up something that they've done. So all of those ways for, of giving are not what God is looking for. It is first a heart that is surrendered to God. And then from that place of surrender, our finances and are an outpouring of that, of that heart that we have towards God. Um, we look at verse 6. Uh, we urge Titus as he had begun, so he would also complete this grace in you as well, referring back to what they had started in when he wrote uh, the, letter, the first letter to the Corinthians. And then 
verse 7, but as you abound in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all diligence, and in your love for us, see that you abound in this grace also. Uh, so uh, just to say, we see that you are excelling in your faith, in uh, in speech and knowledge. So in all of these uh, ways in your walk with God, you excel, and also in your love for us. Uh, so let this um, area of financial giving also be an area in which you excel and which you about. Um, we have a few more minutes. We can just start with uh, verses 8 to 15. Maybe we can read it, and then we can come back and discuss it uh, after the break. Someone can read verses 8 to 15. I speak not by commandment, but I am testing the sincerity of your love by the diligence of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. And in this I give advice. It is to your advantage not only to be doing what you began and were desiring to do a year ago, but now you also must complete the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to desire it, so there also may be a completion out of what you have. For if there is first a willing mind, it is accepted according to what one has, and not according to what he does not have. For I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but by an equality that now at this time your abundance may supply their lack, that their abundance also may supply your lack, that there may be equality. As it is written, he who gathered much had nothing left over, and he who gathered little had no lack. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, Okay, we still have a few minutes, so we'll start discussing this. Um, so here, uh, Paul begins with saying, I'm not commanding you uh, to do this. So this is not something that I am forcing you uh, to do, not using my authority uh, over you to make you do something. Uh, rather, I want to see if your love is genuine. Uh, so I'm testing your love. Uh, for the other believers uh, by comparing it to how other churches have responded. So now the Macedonian church has responded in this way. And I want to see if uh, your love also is genuine as the Macedonian church has shown genuine love. I want to see if your love is genuine. Um, and then verse 9, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus, that though he was rich. So going back to the example of Christ. So uh, Paul is not using his own life as an example or uh, saying uh, you should give because of me, you should give because of who I am, nothing like that. He's saying, look at Jesus himself. Uh, Jesus became poor that you might become rich. Um, and by his example, uh, if we want to be like Christ, this is something that we should be willing to do. Um, and uh, then he says, uh, verse 10, uh, you already began doing this. So they had already started to put away the funds a year previously. Uh, but this letter is to encourage them to complete that process. Uh, so verse 11, you must also complete the doing of it. Uh, so you had this readiness, you had the desire to give, uh, but now we want you to move that desire to actual action uh, and put that to action and complete what you wanted to do. Uh, and then verse 11, if there is a willing mind, it is accepted according to what one has and not according to what he does not have. Um, so in your giving, we are not asking you to give what you actually don't have. So we're not asking you to uh, somehow sacrifice more than you actually have, but we're asking you to give out of what you have. 
Um, so there are some lessons for giving here. Uh, we'll look more in detail at that. We'll just cover all of these verses, and then we'll look more in detail of that, in that uh, about giving uh, specifically. Uh, verse 13, um, I do not mean that others should be eased in your burdens. That is not the way to give, where you are giving so much that you yourself are then uh, in a place of lack or uh, you have uh, extra burdens on yourself, uh, but that there should be equality, that uh, when you have abundantly, you give to those who lack, um, and uh, that when they have abundance, they will give to you. So it is uh, that kind of mindset where we want to be equal. We are not trying to be richer, uh, more successful, uh, more uh, you know, in a better place than others. Rather, we are trying to be in a place of equality where we recognize that somebody doesn't have something. We want them to have it, and we want to be equal rather than uh, competing with one another. Um, so we'll just stop here, and we'll take a 10-minute break and come back.